بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه واجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه آمين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to thank uh, our brother Ali for uh, arranging uh, this session. And uh, the, the, the brothers, uh, the Masjid, Masjid Al-Ikhlas, Jazakumullah uh, Khairun for hosting me today. Today, <coughs> Today we are going to talk about the life of one of the great figures uh, and one of the great leading uh, imams and scholars uh, of this ummah. Mm -hmm. And he is none other than Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. If I can just ask uh, Brother Ali to allow me to share the screen. Uh, I just have a few slides um, that I'm going to share, inshallah. Uh, so uh, we're going to go through the life of uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Uh, and the major event in his life, uh, his trial, the mihna, the he went through um, and after that we are going to um, uh, inshallah ta'ala after that we are going to go through uh, his aqidah very briefly what was his aqidah concerning uh, the attributes of Allah what was his aqidah and his position concerning the sifat, the attributes of Allah. And the reason why we're going to focus on that is because there are people nowadays who uh, are claiming that uh, the imam's position was uh, something that it really was not. So we need to clarify exactly what was the position of Imam Ahmed concerning uh, concerning the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, so let's uh, start, inshallah ta'ala, on the life of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Uh, his full name was Imam Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal ibn Hilal ibn Asad ibn Idris Ibn Abdullah Ibn Hayyan. And so the Imam, he came from a pure Arab family. Uh, unlike many of the other great uh, scholars of that time, uh, especially scholars of Hadith, who were uh, non-Arabs, as we know. The likes of Imam al-Bukhari, uh, Imam Muslim, uh, Abu Dawood, uh, An-Nasa'i, Tirmidhi, etc. They were from Khurasan, uh, and Imam al-Bukhari was from Bukhara. As for Imam Ahmed, he came from a uh, pure Arab family. Uh, his father was from the Dhuhari tribe, uh, and his mother came from the Shaybani family. Both of these two families are pure Arab families. In fact, uh, the scholars, they trace back the lineage of Imam Ahmed to Quraysh. 
uh, his family, they come from Basra in Iraq. Uh, however, it was his grandfather, the grandfather of Imam Ahmed, uh, and his name was Hanbal. So we mentioned his name was Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal. Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn uh, Hanbal. So his grandfather, Hanbal, uh, had left Basra for Khurasan, uh, which is basically modern-day um, modern Iran and uh, Afghanistan. So his father had left for Khurasan to become a governor uh, of the city of Sarkhas. And this was under the Umayyad Khilafa, Bani Umayyah. However, uh, this was towards the end of the Umayyad Khilafah when uh, a revolution, we could say kind of like a revolution had been started. Uh, and basically, this was the Abbasi revolution. Uh, and so the Abbasis were uh, trying to gain power now. And his grandfather joined uh, joined those protests and joined that revolution. Uh, as a result, his father was killed uh, by uh, Bani Umayya. Uh, that was his grandfather. As for his father, Muhammad, as for his father, Muhammad, he was an officer, a soldier in the Abbasid army. So now the Abbasi uh, Khilafah had started uh, and his father was part of the Abbasi army uh, situated in the city of Maru. Maru also being in, uh, in uh, Khurasan. So this is a little bit about his family background. Uh, now his mother, she conceived uh, the Imam while she was in Khurasan. And so she was pregnant with the Imam and she traveled to Baghdad. She traveled to Baghdad where she stayed and she gave birth to Imam Ahmed in Baghdad. So he was born in Baghdad in the year uh, 164. In the year 164 of the Hijrah, which corresponds to approximately 780. While the Imam was young, his father passed away. Uh, his father passed away while he was also young. His father was in his 30s. And uh, Imam Ahmed speaks about this himself. He says, I was brought from Khurasan while still a baby in the womb of my mother. And she gave birth to me here, meaning in Baghdad. So I never saw my grandfather nor my father. So I never saw my grandfather nor my father. So the Imam ended up as an orphan, as a yatim, and he was brought up by his mother in the bustling city of Baghdad. In those days, Baghdad was known as a hub of knowledge filled with scholars from all fields of knowledge. And so it was here that the Imam mastered the various Islamic sciences from a very young age. And he was known for his intelligence. He was also known for his very noble manners, his akhlaq. And so growing up in Baghdad, he was in the company of the great scholars uh, of the ummah of that time. And so one of his main teachers growing up in Baghdad was none other than the student of Imam Abu Hanifa, and that is Abu Yusuf. Uh, however, the methodology of Abu Yusuf uh, was that of Ar-Ra'i, 
was that of Ra'i, which is basically uh, a heavy emphasis on Qiyas. Heavy emphasis on Qiyas. And so the Imam started to lean more towards the study of Hadith. And so this is why he ended up studying under one of the leading scholars of Hadith in Baghdad by the name of Hashim ibn Bashir al-Wasiqi. Hashim ibn Bashir al-Wasiqi. Uh, until, until that scholar passed away. While Imam Ahmed was around the age of 20. So now Imam Ahmed is a grown man. He is uh, a very strong student of knowledge. Uh, I mean, in, in today's uh, in today's day, if he was here, he would be considered a scholar uh, at that age, at the age of twenty. Uh, but he did not stop his uh, seeking of knowledge uh, at that time. Rather, uh, a few years later, he decided to devote himself to collecting a hadith. So, in those days. <clears throat> The ahadith of the Prophet وسلم, were not compiled uh, in, in books. Uh, there were a few books, like the Muwatta of Imam, uh, Imam Malik. But uh, imagine, th this is the time of the great scholars of hadith, the likes of Imam al-Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Abu Dawood, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the books of these scholars were not compiled yet. And so in those days, the way to become a master in, uh, in the field, in the science of hadith, was to go to narrators who narrate hadith and memorize from them. Have them to narrate to you the hadith that they have and you sit down and you memorize those ahadith with their chains, with their chains going all the way back to the Prophet So Imam Ahmed decided to travel for this purpose. So his journey began in the year 186. Uh, and so he traveled to Basra. He traveled to Al-Hijaz. Mecca and Medina, he traveled to Yemen and Al Kufa. So these were the centers of knowledge where there were great scholars of hadith who would narrate a hadith. And so he traveled to, uh, to basically uh, collect all of these hadith. Now, one of the prominent places that uh, Imam Ahmed traveled to was Hijaz. He went there five times. And it was there that he met Imam al-Shafi'i. It was there that he met Imam al-Shafi'i. And so he learned from, the, from Imam al-Shafi'i. Uh, he learned from him his usul uh, and his fiqh. And later on, he met Imam al-Shafi'i again when Imam al-Shafi'i came to Baghdad. In total, Imam Ahmed is reported to have had 414 teachers who he narrated hadith from. Among the most prominent of them were, as we mentioned already, Imam Shafi'i. So Imam Shafi'i is considered one of the teachers of Imam Ahmed. Also, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan, Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah, Abdul Razak ibn Hammam from al-Yemen. In fact, there's a story uh, concerning Imam Ahmed uh, and Abdul Razak. Abdul Razak uh, is known for his uh, book, Musannaf Abdul Razak. It's a compilation of uh, athar, uh, statements of the companions. So Imam Ahmed uh, had traveled for Hajj to Mecca, and um, one of his companions, who he had traveled with, 
uh, they wanted to go to Yemen to meet uh, Abdul Razak. And his companion uh, happened to uh, bump into Abdul Razak while they were making tawaf. So he called Imam Ahmed. He said, look at the Qadr of Allah. Here he is. Imam Abdul Razak is right here with us. Let us benefit from him. So they arranged an appointment to meet him uh, and sit with him and take a hadith uh, from him. Imam Ahmed got angry and he said to his companion that I had the intention to go to Yemen to meet the Imam Abdul Razak. And I'm going to fulfill that intention. It's not enough that we sit with him here in Mecca. We have to go all the way with him back to Yemen. And that's exactly what they ended up doing. Imam Ahmed traveled all the way to Yemen and sat with Abdul Razak uh, and took uh, hadith from him. Also among the uh, teachers uh, of Imam Ahmed was Sufi, uh, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, uh, Ishaq ibn Rahawiyya. Uh, so these were some of the prominent uh, scholars of hadith, like I said, these are a few, a few names, uh, but these are the most famous uh, of them. And so with this knowledge, he became a leading authority on hadith. Imam Ahmed ended up returning to Baghdad after his uh, travels. Uh, Ibn al-Jawzi, Ibn al-Jawzi mentions in his uh, biography of Imam Ahmed, he says, Imam Ahmed did not set himself up for the position of narrating hadith and giving fatawa until he reached the age of 40. And only after his reputation was well known throughout the Muslim world. He says his classes would be packed to the point where some narrators mention that the number who would attend to listen to him were around 5,000, but only 500 would be transcribing, writing, while the remaining would be learning from his etiquette and his manners. So this shows us the importance of uh, seeking knowledge with scholars at the feet of scholars. This is an example of the importance of taking knowledge uh, by visiting ulama and sitting with them. Uh, unfortunately, in this day and age, uh, people, they suffice with uh, self, self-learning uh, and you know, learning from the internet. Yes, it's a ni'mah, it's a blessing that we have this opportunity to learn online. However, uh, a true student of knowledge will travel and will sit with the scholars because there are certain things that you cannot get uh, online uh, through online learning. And that is, as we mentioned in this example, the etiquette uh, and the manners of, of the ulama. So look here, 5,000 would be attending, only 500 would be writing. Uh, the rest would be learning from the akhlaq and the etiquette of the imam. Uh, besides this public uh, class that he uh, would I'm sorry, have. Sheikh, uh, sorry to interrupt you. There's some brothers who are trying to get in because you're the host, Sheikh, if you can oh, uh, okay. let them in. Yeah, inshallah. Uh, now, besides this public class that he would have, Imam Ahmed also had uh, private classes with his close students. Uh, and they are those who went on to become giants of hadith themselves. So obviously, uh, Imam Ahmed in his public gatherings, uh, he, he would be teaching hadith, but in his private circles, he would be narrating a hadith and uh, you know, basically giving his asanid to uh, his close students. Among the most prominent of his students, among the most prominent of his students, uh, Imam Ahmed had hundreds of students, but the most prominent among them 
were uh, some of the great scholars of hadith. Uh, the likes of Imam al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari was a student of Imam Ahmed. Imam Muslim. Uh, Abu Dawood. Abu Dawood. In fact, if you were to go through uh, the Sunan of Abu Dawood, you would find many a hadith where the narration of Abu Dawood starts. He says, Haddathana Ahmed. Uh, I am narrating directly from Imam Ahmed. And he starts the, 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 the chain from Imam Ahmed. Uh, also, Imam at Tirmidhi was his student. Also, An Nasa'i. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously, without a doubt, his two sons. And so Imam Ahmed had two sons. Uh, they were uh, scholars themselves. Uh, and they were Salih and Abdullah. Salih and Abdullah. Uh, also, his uncle, the uncle of Imam Ahmed, Ishaq. Ishaq was his uncle. Uh, Ishaq ibn Hanbal. And also his nephew. His nephew. So the, 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 the nephew of Imam Ahmed, uh, and his name was Hanbal. Uh, finally, one last thing that we can mention uh, concerning Imam Ahmed is uh, his famous work that he left behind, and that is his Musnad, the Musnad of Imam Ahmed. Uh, and so a Musnad is a compilation of a hadith. Uh, it's different than a Sunan. So you have a Sunan, like Sunan Abi Dawood, Sunan al-Tirmidhi. The Sunan are compilations of hadith that are arranged by chapter based on topics. So usually the topics of fiqh, for example, kitab al-Tahara, kitab al-Salah, uh, zakah, hajj, etc. Uh, and then they have other chapters like uh, tafsir, um, al-Sira, al-Maghazi, uh, a, a chapter on aqidah, Iman, etc. A Musnad is arranged by chapters based on the narrator. So there would be chapters based on the names of the companions who narrated those ahadith. So all the narrations of, for example, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas would be one chapter. The next chapter would be all the narrations of uh, let's say Abdullah ibn Umar. The next chapter would be all of the narrations of Aisha radiallahu anha, etc. So Imam Ahmed compiled his Musnad. His Musnad is well known. It is one of the uh, leading, uh, one of the top uh, books of hadith that we refer to. Uh, and so Imam Ahmed started writing it when he was around the age of 36 after returning from his journey to Yemen, where he sat with uh, Imam Abdul Razak, as we mentioned. And so from more than 700,000 ahadith, which he had collected throughout his, his travels, he selected only 30,000 ahadith. He selected only 30,000 ahadith, uh, which he narrated on the authority of 283 of his teachers. Towards the end of his life, Imam Ahmed revised the Musnad with his son, uh, with his son Abdullah. And so he revised it, edited it, uh, removed several uh, weak narrations. Uh, and then when Imam Ahmed passed away, it was only his son Abdullah who uh, went on to narrate the Musnad uh, of his father. So this is concerning the Musnad of Imam Ahmed. Uh, one last thing that we can mention is that uh, the opinions of Imam Ahmed, his fiqh-related opinions, were recorded uh, and noted by his students who went on to pass it on to their students. And in this way, uh, a school was started, uh, a madhab, 
had started, and that was the madhab of Imam Tirmidhi, which lasted until today. So when it comes to fiqh, we have four main madhab, uh, the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, the madhab of Imam Malik, the madhab of Imam Shafi'i, and finally the madhab of Imam Ahmed ibn Hamdi. There were other scholars in those days who also had students who uh, passed on you know, the, the fiqh opinions of their teachers. However, those madhabs did not last. They died out in the course of history. Uh, the, the likes of Imam al-Awza'i, for example, uh, or al-Layth, uh, and others. Uh, and Imam Ahmed, uh, also his madhab was one of those that was uh, about to die. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, gave life to this madhab and allowed it to continue uh, until today. And so today uh, it is one of the, uh, one of the well-known uh, madhabs uh, uh, that um, are followed. Now, there is one uh, final thing to talk about concerning Imam Ahmed, and that is, uh, and that is the mihna. So, what does it mean when we refer to the mihna of Imam Ahmed? A mihna is a trial, a very huge fitna a very huge trial uh, that basically affects everyone. And so Imam Ahmed went through a very huge trial. And so this trial was basically uh, the issue of the Quran and what do we consider the Qur'an to be? Now, prior to the time of Imam Ahmed, there were people who, uh, people of bid'ah, innovators, who were starting to deny certain attributes of Allah, like uh, Allah's attribute of speech. So you had Jaham ibn Safwan, who, you know, spread this ideology. And he was eventually killed. We're talking about in the days of Bani Umayyah. Uh, but he managed to spread his ideology before he was killed. And his ideology on the sifat, on the attributes of Allah, was picked up by the Mu'tazila. So the Mu'tazila, were who we can call the rationalists, those who say we have to use the intellect to understand everything. And so we don't just simply submit to whatever Allah and his messenger have mentioned. We have to use our rationale and our intellect. And so if there is something that goes against our human intellect that we find in the Quran or in the Sunnah, then we have to reject it and we have to put forward our human intellect. This is basically uh, the position of the Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila uh, did not have that much power initially. Uh, so in the days of Harun al-Rashid, Harun al-Rashid was the Khalifa, uh, one of the early Khulafa of Bani, Abba, uh, Bani Abbas, of the Abbasi Khilafa. During his days, uh, uh, the Mu'tazila did not have that much power. However, when his son came to power, the son of Harun al-Rashid, al-Ma'moon, when al-Ma'moon came to power, al-Ma'moon was very educated in the various sciences, including philosophy. And so he ended up having close relations with the Mu'tazila. And he picked up their aqidah. 
and he favored it. And he made some of his close advisors to be from the scholars of the Mu'tazila. And so initially they were spreading their ideology concerning the attributes of Allah. And among their beliefs was that the Quran, that the Quran is something created. It is something created and the speech of Allah is not real speech. So the speech of Allah is not real speech, but rather the Quran that was sent down by Allah is created just like everything else is created. Just like everything else is created. Whereas our belief as a sunnah wal jama'ah is that the kalam, the speech of Allah, is one of his attributes. And all of Allah's attributes are uncreated. They are a part of Allah. All of Allah's attributes are a part of him. And no part of Allah is created. So this is the position of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and the Salaf. So the Mu'tazila, now they told uh, the Khalifa al Ma'moon that we are finding opposition to this position of ours from among the scholars. And so we have to now force this position on everyone. We have to use our authority and force this position on everyone. So that is exactly what ended up happening. And so al Ma'moon agreed. And so uh, he acted upon this in the year 212 of the Hijrah, uh, or, or in, the year, in the year 218, in the year 218. Uh, and this was the year of his death. This was the year of his death. And so he sent uh, messengers to the various cities to gather the scholars and have them acknowledge that the Quran is created. Whoever did not acknowledge, he would be punished. And so there were scholars who, you know, uh, caved in and, you know, they, they, they did not want to go through uh, any kind of punishment, any kind of hardship. And so they caved in, they buckled in, and they ended up saying, yes, the Qur'an is created. And among these scholars were some of the great scholars uh, of that time. You know, imagine the likes of Yahya ibn Ma'in, Ali ibn al-Madini. Uh, these were some of the scholars who initially they had resisted. Initially they had resisted, but then uh, they ended up, uh, you know, um, uh, caving into the pressure and they ended up saying that the Quran is created. Imam Ahmed was one of the few who resisted and put up a stand and refused to cave into the pressure. And so Imam Ahmed was summoned to the Khalifa. And so he went in chains. He went in chains. And on the way, on the way, uh, it so happened that the Khalifa had passed away. That the Khalifa had passed away. And so they returned Imam Ahmed back to Baghdad. And so he was saved from any kind of uh, trial in front of the Khalifa. Uh, and he ends up returning to Baghdad, but in prison. And so he remained in prison. Uh, now, the Khalifa after Al-Ma'moon, 
was Al Mu'tasim. Al Mu'tasim, he took over after Al Ma'mun, and he continued the same mihna, the same trial, and continued the pressure uh, on uh, the ulama. And so Imam Ahmed was uh, still under a lot of pressure to um, admit and say that the Quran is created, and he refused. Uh, he was even threatened that they're going to kill you. Uh, but none of that, you know, uh, none of that uh, caused him to cave in to the pressure. Um, and so Imam Ahmed was uh, brought to the Khalifa al Mu'tasim. And there, there were several scholars of the Mu'tazila, of the Mu'tazila who uh, were told to argue with Imam Ahmed and convince him that, look, the Qur'an is created. And so they brought various evidences and, uh, you know, Imam Ahmed would uh, refute their arguments in front of the Khalifa, in front of the Khalifa. Uh, and, you know, uh, Imam Ahmed was told, you, you have to be careful. You know, the Khalifa, he's going to lose his patience. And eventually, he's gonna he's gonna kill you. So, uh, eventually, no, nothing nothing uh, uh, deterred Imam Ahmed from uh, his position, and so um, he was taken. Uh, he was taken to be tortured. He was taken to be tortured. And so it is narrated that um, uh, there were two uh, there were two torturers uh, who would whip Imam Ahmed, uh, each one taking turns, each one taking turns at uh, whipping him uh, very severely, and uh, to the point where Imam Ahmed eventually lost consciousness. He lost consciousness. He fell. He fainted. And, um, uh, you know, uh, still none of that deterred him. He would wake up from consciousness and, uh, you know, he would be uh, tortured some more. And eventually, uh, he, they gave up and they threw him into prison. And so the imam, he ended up uh, in prison for uh, approximately uh, two and a half years. Uh, approximately two and a half years. Um, and uh, uh, none of that deterred, deterred the imam. And eventually, after a lot of public pressure, and so you can imagine that the, the public started to interfere. They would come to the Khalifa and demand that Imam Ahmed is released. Uh, and so he showed strength. And because of this strength that he showed and steadfastness, uh, he, gained, he gained popularity. He gained popularity. As opposed to what many people think that the only way I can become popular is by uh, by compromising and uh, becoming accepted by the rulers, the authority, or by the people. Uh, no, the opposite is true. Allah raises people, elevates people uh, because they stick to the truth, because they stick to the truth. So, Pressure was mounting on the Khalifa to release the Imam. So eventually uh, he was released. Eventually he was released and um, uh, he was sent home. He was sent home. When he reaches home, they find that he is brutally injured throughout all over his body, on his back, on his front, even on his face. There are marks and there are several injuries. And so he was treated there. 
and uh, it is mentioned that some of these marks lasted until his death. Now, after the death of uh, Al Mu'tasim in the year 2227, uh, Al Wathiq took over, and Al Wathiq uh, continued the same uh, suppression uh, and continued uh, in the way of his. Um, uh, of the former Khulafa Al-Ma'moon and Al-Mu'tasim continuing the fitna and the mihna uh, concerning the Quran being created forcing this view on the on the people and on the scholars uh, however um, Imam Ahmed uh, Imam Ahmed uh, was still at home and um, he was banned from teaching publicly. So Imam Ahmed during this time was banned from teaching publicly. Uh, he was banned from uh, having any kind of gatherings. So he remained at home and did not even go out for Salah. He would not even go out for Salah. Um, and eventually he had to uh, become... A hostage he had to uh, you know leave home and uh, hide in other people's houses uh, for the remainder of al wathiq's life for the remainder of al wathiq's uh, reign in power because eventually imam ahmed was uh, summoned again he was asked to come to the khalifa and he didn't want to, to do that so he went into hiding. He went into hiding. Um, eventually, the mihna was brought to an end. And this was with the death of al wathiq and his successor, Al-Mutawakkil, coming into power. And, and so Al-Mutawakkil, becomes the new Khalifa in the year 232 of the Hijrah. And he was not like, uh, he was not like uh, the former Khulafa, but rather uh, he was with the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and with the scholars of Hadith. And so he allowed Imam Ahmed to return to uh, teaching, uh, which is what the Imam did. He ended up coming out after all of these years, uh, returning to teaching, uh, and uh, you know, obviously, with all the popularity that uh, you know he has now, um, uh, his gatherings were always filled and packed. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, those numbers of thousands attending his gatherings were most likely during this period of time after the mihna. Um, so this is the summary of the mihna. This is the summary of the mihna. Uh, there are many stories that are mentioned uh, from uh, Imam Ahmed by his sons concerning the mihna, but we don't have time to uh, go through all of that. Um, uh, one one source that one can use is this book right here called uh, Kitab al-Mihna. Kitab, uh, Kitab al-Mihna. Uh, it is the entire story of the Mihna uh, narrated by narrated by Hanbal ibn Ishaq. Hanbal ibn Ishaq. He is, we mentioned earlier, he is the nephew of Imam Ahmed, the nephew of Imam Ahmed. He narrated uh, the Mihna, the story of the Mihna. All right, so uh, with that, we come to the end of uh, the Mihna. Uh, we'll conclude uh, this part of, uh, uh, of the session on the death of Imam Ahmed. And so uh, there's a there's a story at the time when Imam Ahmed was approaching death, 
and this is narrated by uh, Abdullah, Abdullah, the son of Imam Ahmed. He says that when death approached my father, I was sitting with him, and he began to drift in and out of consciousness. Then he opened up his eyes, and he said, indicating with his hand, he said, no, not yet. No, not yet. Abdullah says he repeated this three times. He repeated this three times. After the third time, I said, my father, what is it that you said? You fell into unconsciousness until we thought that you were gone, that you had passed away. Then you regained consciousness and you said, no, not yet. No, not yet. So Imam Ahmed, he said, my son, do you not know? Do you not know what was happening? And so I said, no. And so Imam Ahmed said, Shaytan was standing in front of me. And he said to me, O oh, Ahmed, you have evaded me. You have escaped from me. You have won. You know, the test of this life is to defeat Shaytan, our enemy. Because shaitan, you know, made an oath that he is going to take all of us with him to the hellfire. And so at the time of death, when there are only a few breaths remaining, shaitan is not giving up. And so he comes to Imam Ahmed and says, you have evaded me. And so Imam Ahmed says, shaitan said, you have evaded me, but I replied, no, not yet. No, not yet. It's not over. It's not over until my soul leaves my body. And so again, again, what a huge lesson in, you know, from the life of Imam Ahmed in remaining steadfast, remaining firm and steadfast until the very last moment, until the very last moment. Imam Ahmed passed away on a Friday uh, in the year 241 uh, of the Hijrah at the age of 77. And his janazah was attended by thousands. In fact, Baghdad had never witnessed such a large procession for a janazah before. And this reminds us of a statement of Imam Ahmed himself. You know, Imam Ahmed had a very famous statement uh, concerning uh, the difference between Ahlul Bid'ah and Ahlul Sunnah, the people of the truth and the people of falsehood. How can we know who is victorious? Imam Ahmed said, Tell the innovators, between us and you are the days of Janazah, meaning that. The end is what proves who is victorious and who is not. Yes, today you have the upper hand. You know, the Mu'tazila in the days of Imam Ahmed, they had the upper hand. You know, they were, uh, they were uh, victorious, you know, in the, in the eyes of the people. But Imam Ahmed said no. The end is what will decide. And how do we know the end? The days of the Janazah. So the fact that Imam Ahmed's janazah was attended by thousands, uh, literally thousands of people were attending. Whereas the opponents of Imam Ahmed, you know, some of the Mu'attazili scholars, when, when their deaths uh, occurred, barely anyone attended their janazahs. Barely anyone attended their janazas. Uh, in this regard, we have a, a, a statement of Imam Ahmed, uh, another statement of Imam Ahmed. Uh, basically, uh, some of the companions of Imam Ahmed, some of his students said to him, uh, you know, when the Imam was uh, you know, um, at home, and he was not allowed to preach publicly. He was not allowed to teach publicly. 
uh, he was confined to his home, they said to him, uh, Oh, Abu Abdullah, have you not seen how falsehood has become victorious over the truth? So Imam Ahmed said, No. ما دامت القلوب ثابتة فالحق هو المنتصر. As long as the hearts remain firm, then the truth will be victorious. The truth will be victorious, and that's exactly what we see from the life of Imam. He remained firm and steadfast, and because of that, this trial ended. And you know, the Mu'tazila after that. their influence started to disappear and you know today today there is no such thing as the Mu'tazili school uh, yes there are people nowadays who uh, will try to um, revive the ideology of the Mu'tazila but as a school that is followed that has you know curriculums and teachers etc there is no There is no such thing. So this is the life of Imam Ahmed. Uh, as I promised earlier, we have one last thing to discuss. And that is the haqidah of Imam Ahmed on the sifat, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the attributes of Allah. What was his position? Now, the position of the salaf, who Imam Ahmed was a follower of, their position on the attributes of Allah was that we affirm whatever Allah and his messenger have mentioned of attributes. We affirm these attributes in wording and in meaning. So Allah says that he speaks. We affirm the fact that Allah speaks. Kalam is an attribute of Allah. And we affirm the meaning of that. The meaning of that is that Allah speaks. Everyone understands what it means to speak. But the position of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and the Salaf is that we don't know how Allah speaks. We affirm that Allah speaks and all of Allah's attributes. For example, Allah istawa ala al arsh He rose uh, over the throne. We all understand what that means. It is the apparent meaning that we are affirming, but we don't know how. We don't know how. So this is what we refer to as ithbat of the ma'na, affirming the meaning, affirming the meaning. This was the position of the salaf, and this was the position of Imam Ahmed. Now, the asha'ira, the Ash'aris, as well as the Maturidis, they claim that the position of the Salaf, and including Imam Ahmed, was that they did not affirm the apparent meanings of Allah's attributes. They affirmed the attributes, but when it came to the meanings, They said the meanings are only known to Allah. The meanings of these attributes are only known to Allah. So what we would like to do is see what was the position of Imam Ahmed. What was his position? So we have three possibilities here. The first possibility is that Imam Ahmed did ta'wil of the attributes. So ta'wil is where you say that the apparent meanings are not intended. The apparent meanings of the attributes are not intended. And we cannot leave these attributes without a meaning. So let us give a meaning to these attributes. And so ta'wil is to give them metaphorical meanings. To give them metaphorical meanings. So, for example, Allah rising above the throne, al-istiwa. Fine, we believe that we believe in this attribute, but we don't believe it in the real sense. 
it doesn't mean that Allah actually rose above the throne. Let us give it a metaphorical meaning. So let us say that it means authority. It means Allah's authority. Or that Allah is tawla. He sees the throne. So this is what we refer to as ta'wil. And ta'wil is the position adopted by the Asha'ira. So the later Asha'ira, they adopted this position. Was Imam Ahmed's position the position of ta'wil? No. So we can rule that out. If we look at the statements of Imam Ahmed, it is clear that he was not on this view. And I don't know of anyone who claims that Imam Ahmed did ta'wil. We come now to the second possibility, and that is tafwil. What is tafwil? Tafwil is to relegate the meanings, uh, to relegate something to Allah, to say, I don't know what this is, I leave it to Allah. Now, when it comes to Allah's attributes, there are two kinds of tafweed. One is to say that uh, Allah's attributes, um, we affirm that these are real attributes. Uh, so, for example, the speech of Allah, Allah speaks, and his speech is real. He speaks with... Um, with letters, making words, making sentences, and with a sound, a voice that can be heard. But how Allah does that, we don't know. How exactly that is, we leave this knowledge to Allah. This is called tafweel of the kayfiyah. And this is correct. This is what we should do. But the tafweel that the Ashaira claim concerning the Salaf and concerning Imam Ahmed is they say that uh, they left the meanings to Allah. So, for example, what does it mean that Allah speaks? We don't know. We don't know what it means that Allah speaks. We affirm that Allah speaks, but what does that mean? Only Allah knows. We, we, we relegate the meaning of that to Allah. So this is called tafweed al-ma'na. Tafweed of the ma'na, of the meaning. And this is what the Asha'ira of today, uh, they are claiming concerning Imam Ahmed. Concerning Imam Ahmed. And this is not true, as we will see, as we will see, insha'Allah ta'ala. And so we can rule that out. And that leaves us with one, one final option, and that is if that, and that is to affirm the meanings. And when we say the meanings, we mean the apparent meanings of Allah's attributes. If that al-ma'na, and this is the position of Imam Ahmed, as we will see. So, when we look at the statements of Imam Ahmed, we see that he affirms Allah's attributes. We see that he affirms Allah's attributes. Now, what will the Ashaira uh, hold on to to try to prove that he was on the position of tafweed? There is one statement of Imam Ahmed that they will try to use. Imam Ahmed was asked about certain attributes of Allah. So, for example, Allah's nuzul, him coming down, descending to the sama of the dunya, and that Allah will be seen on the day of judgment, and other similar ahadith. He was asked about these ahadith that mention Allah's attributes. Imam Ahmed responded, he said, we believe in them and hold them as truth without delving into the hows or their meanings. And we reject, and we do not reject any of them. We do not reject any of them. So this shows that uh, he did ithbat. He affirmed the attributes of Allah. Now, what will the Ashara try to use 
and the neo Hanbalis of today, they will use this statement of Imam Ahmed, where he says, without delving into the hows or their meanings, without delving into their hows or their meanings. So they say, look, he is negating any kind of meaning for Allah's attributes. So how do we uh, prove that Imam Ahmed did not negate the apparent meaning? By looking at the obvious, by looking at the obvious, and that is the mihna of Imam Ahmed concerning the Quran being created. <sighs> Whoever goes through the mihna of Imam Ahmed will realize that he insisted on saying not only that the Qur'an is the kalam of Allah, but also that it is not created. Whereas a person of tafweeb would not go beyond saying kalam Allah, and that's it. He wouldn't say that it is not created. Because when you say it is not created, you are giving a meaning, and you're delving into whether it is created or not. In fact, there were those who, in the time of Imam Ahmed, who, who tried to take a neutral position on this issue by saying that we're not going to get into it at all. And so Imam Ahmed, when he was asked about these people, he said they are the Jahmiyyah. They are on the position of the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiyyah. Why? Because they are refraining from affirming the truth concerning the issue of the Qur'an. So there's only truth and falsehood concerning this. There is no neutral position. Moreover, uh, Abdullah, Imam Ahmed's son, uh, he narrates that uh, um, Imam Ahmed uh, was asked, what about those who say that the Quran is the kalam of Allah without saying that it is not created? Without saying that it is not created, Imam Ahmed regarded them to be Jahmi. And Abu Dawood also narrates that Imam Ahmed was asked, Does anyone have an excuse to say that the Quran is the speech of Allah and then remain silent? Imam Ahmed said, Why would he have to remain silent? If it wasn't for what the people have fallen into, meaning the mihna, uh, concerning the Quran being created, Imam Ahmed says, if it wasn't for the for what the people have fallen into, then he wouldn't have remained silent. Meaning, he's remaining silent because of the pressure. He doesn't want to publicly say that the Quran is not created. Imam Ahmed goes on to say, but since they, the Jahmiyyah, have already spoken, saying that the Quran is created, why would we? not say that the Qur'an is uncreated. Meaning that the only reason why Imam Ahmed stood up and delved into this issue to prove that the Qur'an is not created is because of the bid'ah of the Mu'tazil, them promoting this, this view. If they had not, you know, delved into whether the Qur'an was created or not, then we wouldn't have any reason to, to delve into that ourselves. And so this is a very important statement because Imam Ahmed states that if it wasn't for the fact that the Jahmiyyah denied the zahir, the apparent meaning, that the Qur'an is literally the speech of Allah, one may have an excuse for simply stopping and saying that the Qur'an is the kalam of Allah without adding not created. But when the Jahmiyyah and the Mu'tazila denied the Zahir, the apparent meanings, Imam Ahmed, you know, obligated, uh, he made it compulsory upon the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah to use the terms and phrases that may not be mentioned in the Quran. You know, like uh, 
whether the Quran is created or not. Emphasize, to emphasize the apparent obvious meanings of the text. That the Quran is literally the word of Allah and not his creation. And so how then can we say that Imam Ahmed was a mufawwid, uh, believing in tafweed of the meanings of the attributes? Not only that, but how about Imam Ahmed affirming that Allah literally speaks with a sound and numerous narrations, such as from his son Abdullah, who says in his book as sunnah I asked my father about a people who say, when Allah spoke to Musa, he did not speak with a sound. My father replied, in fact, your Lord spoke with a sound, for we narrate these hadith as they have reached us. Also, Al-Khalal narrates in his sunnah that Imam Ahmed was asked, Allah is above the seventh heaven, upon his throne, separate from his creation while his power and knowledge are everywhere. Is this true? Imam Ahmed replied, yes, he is upon the throne and nothing escapes his knowledge. So here Imam Ahmed is affirming that Allah is above his creation in the real sense. Al-Khalal also reports that Imam Ahmed was asked about someone who says, Allah is not above his throne. To which Imam Ahmed replied, their entire statement revolves around kufr. And then Al-Khalal quotes Imam Ahmed uh, saying he is upon his throne above the seventh heaven. Uh, also, Imam Ahmed says in his book Kitab al-Sunnah regarding the hadith of al-Ru'ya, Allah being seen, uh, he says, Imam Ahmed says, the hadith, according to us, is upon its apparent obvious meaning, as it has come from the Prophet ﷺ. Delving into it is a bid'ah. Meaning, delving into, you know, how this attribute is, it is a bid'ah. However, we believe in it as it has come, upon its apparent obvious meaning, and we do not debate anyone concerning it. So in these narrations, it is obvious to anyone that Imam Ahmed articulated the vahir, the apparent meanings of the texts of the Quran and Sunnah in his own words. And that, you know, uh, that is only possible if Imam Ahmed affirms the vahir of the texts. And so the narrations are too many to quote. Uh, and, you know, this claim that Imam Ahmed was upon tafweed is too weak to refute. But I hope the, you know, um, the point is now clear. Uh, one final thing, coming back to the statement of Imam Ahmed that we mentioned in the beginning that the Ash'ara and the neo, the neo Hanbalis today they will use, where Imam Ahmed says, um, you know, we are, uh, Imam Ahmed says, we, be, uh, we believe in them, the attributes of Allah and hold them as truth without delving into the hows or their meanings. So what was Imam Ahmed negating here when he says we don't delve into the hows or their meaning, the ma'na? What exactly, what he, what exactly was he uh, referring here? What he was referring to here was the misinterpreted meanings that the Jahmiya gave the misinterpreted meanings that the Jahmiya gave to the attributes. And so what proves this? Uh, is what we have already mentioned. The question is, why would Imam Ahmed say we don't delve into the meanings? Right? Why? Because the Jahmiya were giving false meanings to, to these attributes. So for example, Allah rising above the throne, istawa ala al they said it means istawla, he seized it or he took control of it. 
So it was these misinterpreted meanings that he was that he was uh, refuting. Now, naturally, Imam Ahmed's response would be, Allah rules above the throne without any meaning or without any tafsir intended by that. Right? However, uh, however, because they were giving false meanings to these attributes, he mentioned the statement that we don't delve into their meanings. Whatever the case, what is crystal clear from the statements of Imam Ahmed and these narrations that we have gone through is that he definitely affirmed the zahir, the apparent uh, meanings of the attributes of Allah. And this is something that no one can deny. Also, Imam al dahabi mentions in his book al alu that to negate the zahir, the uh, apparent meanings of the attributes of Allah, uh, it was a relatively new phenomenon uh, invented by the later Mutakallimun. It was not something that existed in the time of Imam Ahmed. And this is something very important to point out because modern day Ash'aris claim that this was the position of the Salaf. But there is no evidence to prove that such a concept even existed in their time. This idea of tafweev, uh, of the, the, the ma'na of Allah's attributes. Uh, and Allah knows best. So this is where uh, we come to the end of uh, this session. Uh, I hope it was beneficial uh, for everyone. Uh, and whatever I have said that happened to be correct and true, it was from Allah alone. Whatever that I may have said that was incorrect, then it was from Shaytan and my, my own self. Uh, if there are any questions, then perhaps we can uh, take these questions. <coughs> I'll uh, give it back to Brother Ali. Uh, any brother who, who has a question, they can uh, just uh, unmute themselves and ask it. So we'll give you minutes, else uh, we'll end up the talk. Okay. Yeah, for the moment, I can't see any questions, Sheikh, but the, the new Hanbalis, I mean, a lot, we can see them, you know, they use sometimes expressions of Ibn Qudama or other scholars, but if we, in other of his books, like Ibn Qudama, he, he clearly uses the hadith of the Jariya to sell us above the arch, and he uses, so you, you can't just, they take some statements of Hanbali scholars, but they leave the other apparent in which they clearly affirm a meaning about Allah being over, up on the arsh. And they use other example of Musa and Pharaoh and others, Abdul Ghani Maghdisi. So sometimes they will use just one of the statement saying the ma'na only Allah knows, but sometimes maybe they intend by ma'na uh, the kafiyah. So that's the problem nowadays with Hanbal is they use a lot Ibn Qudama's book. Yes, yes, that's true. And so uh, we have to look at all of the statements holistically. We have to bring all of their statements together. And this is the way of, uh, you know, the people of Bid'ah, that they will always latch on to certain statements that they are, you know, they've already decided that this is their position and they're going to go now and look for any statements that coincide and uh, fall in line with their position. Uh, they don't only do that with the Quran or the Sunnah, but they do that with even the statements of the scholar uh, to try to say, look, uh, this is the position of so, such and such scholar. And they ignore all of the other statements of that scholar. And the same thing uh, with, uh, you know, the, the, the Hanbali school in general. So 
yes, there may have been certain uh, ulama from the Hanbali madhab who took a position of, let's say, tafweed or even ta'weed. So they will, what they will do is they will look for those scholars and they will bring their statements and then they will attribute it to the madhab and say, look, the position of the Hanbali madhab is tafweed or ta'weed. Why? Because of the statements of these Hanbali scholars. While ignoring and forgetting about the hundreds of other Hanbali scholars throughout history who, you know, had uh, a completely different position, and that is the position of Ithba, uh, beginning from Imam Ahmad all the way uh, until our time, ignoring all of those scholars. Uh, and so taking a minority opinion and uh, attributing it. Uh, to the matter. But, you know, this is the way of the people of Bid'ah. Uh, and so this is what we need to expose. We need to expose this and show the people the truth. Also, some people, they said they're all interpretation of late scholars. But if they, they were all ishtihadat, why would the Salaf go to jail and... Um, you know, if it was all just extrapolation from themselves, and you know, some people they say, Oh, the Sahaba that didn't speak about these issues, so all this group, Ashari, Mutazili, they're all just ishtihadat. But how Sheikh, the problem when we ask them is Imam Ahmad, he took it from his teacher, Imam Tirmizi, he traveled to all lands, and he said, That's what I heard from Imam Ahmad Isa. They learned it from the Tabi'i. and they learned it from the Sahaba. So if they had heard from any of them that that will was okay, or we don't know the meaning, they wouldn't have taken such position and gone to jail. So sometimes we're just astonished by some speakers, especially in the West, saying, oh, they're all accepted ishtihada, the Sahaba didn't speak. So whichever you take is fine. I mean, what's your opinion, Sheikh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the answer to this is very simple. Uh, the Sahaba did not have any reason to speak about these issues because uh, there was no deviant uh, position concerning Allah's attributes in their time. Uh, the same thing with Imam Ahmed. Why did he delve into uh, the issue of the Quran not being created? Because of uh, the pre presence uh, of the view that the Quran is created. So when deviant views start to appear and start to spread and a lot of people start to adopt these deviant views we have to stand up now and you know oppose it and show how you know this is not an issue of ijtihad this is an issue of al-haq and batil you know uh, this view that is going around is a deviant view and the other alternative, which is the hub, that is the truth. It's not a position where, okay, you guys have your opinion. It's based on your ishtihad. We have our opinion based on our ishtihad. That's not how it works. Yes, there are certain matters in our deen that go back to ishtihad. But, you know, these issues are not one of those issues. So the Sahaba not speaking about them was because it was not an issue in their in their time you know uh the first one to speak about the attributes of allah denying allah's attributes came after the time of the sahaba jad ibn dirham the teacher of jahan ibn safwan and when he came out claiming that allah never spoke to musa alayhi salam and he never took ibrahim as a khalil so denying allah's attributes outright Straight away, uh, you know, the scholars spoke against him and he was slaughtered, he was killed. And the same thing with Jahmi ibn Safwan. So the scholars in, in that time, they did speak out. They spoke out about these deviancies and these deviations concerning Allah's attributes. And the same thing today, you know, if, if, uh, if we have ideologies that are present today, and we do. 
you know, liberalism, secularism, uh, feminism. These are ideologies that are new, that never existed in the past. Are you going to come now and say, oh, the Sahaba never spoke about these issues? So it's open to ijtihad. If you want to be a feminist, if you want to be a liberal, you can be a liberal and a feminist because, you know, it's your ijtihad. And if you don't want to uh, accept liberalism and feminism, then it's okay. It's your ijtihad. No. Right? Uh, these are new matters. These are new deviations. We need to stand up and resist them and speak out against them and show how these ideologies are deviant. They oppose the core of Islam, the very essence of Islam. And we're not going to remain silent. And we're not going to compromise. And we're going to stand up for the truth like Imam Ahmed did. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us that kind of steadfastness and that kind of firmness uh, in resisting uh, any kind of pressure to cave in uh, or to compromise on our beliefs. Uh, and so the greatest lesson that we learn from the life of Imam Ahmed is this. The greatest lesson that we learn from the life of Imam Ahmed is, uh, you know, uh, this, this, uh, this example that he left behind of standing up for the truth. Standing up for the truth and not uh, caving into the pressure, no matter how much the pressure mounts. Uh, some of uh, the scholars who um, who caved in in the time of Imam Ahmed, uh, we mentioned Yahya ibn Ma'in. Uh, Imam Ahmed, when he heard, he was really saddened, you know, that these are scholars of hadith who are mountains of knowledge, giants. And he was he, he was asked about them. He said they have no excuse. They have no excuse for, uh, for, for caving into the pressure. They were not tortured. And they were. These scholars were taken for the first time before the Khalifa. And, you know, if they did not uh, respond and say that the Quran was created, they were going to be punished. So before being, uh, you know, punished, they, they caved in. Imam Ahmed said they have no excuse. If they were punished and under duress, under torture, then, you know, they said that, you know, the Quran is created, then perhaps they have an excuse. But before that, no excuse. You know, and so this is the, 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 the greatest lesson that we learned from the life of Imam Ahmed. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Mashallah, it was very uh, informative talk. Uh, and Sheikh Malatala bless all your works for all our viewers who, and who are going to view it on YouTube as well. The Sheikh on his YouTube channel ha has um, many lectures uh, on the names. Uh, one of the most details I have found in English language uh, on the names of Allah SWT and, and explanation. And he, he has as well uh, Sira and other courses. So on his YouTube, uh, with it, the courses, the books he teaches, he also has on his YouTube channel um, many beneficial lessons. And we hope, inshallah, Sheikh, maybe one day, inshallah, visit us in England and inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah. I, I will end the meeting, Sheikh, if you say the last uh, dua. And we, okay, and, inshallah. Yeah. Jazakallah khair. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, grant us beneficial knowledge. Uh, and uh, acting upon that knowledge. And we ask Allah to grant us steadfastness uh, and, and uh, firmness upon his deen until the day we meet him. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk wa sallillahumma wa sallim ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.